Now we move on to understanding the client. Some of you have tried to address the client's needs without actually knowing what the needs are. Dangerous territory for salespeople. Don't proffer a solution until you know what the problem is. Good rule, okay? Don't proffer a solution until you know what the problem is. Because you're supplying it in pink, but I want it in blue. And you start telling me about your really wonderful pink and how great your pink is. And it's this and it's that. I don't care about pink. I care about blue. So don't waste your breath on the wrong thing. How will you know what is the right thing? This is how we know what the right thing is. We go through each one. So by asking questions, what we're trying to do here is uncover and appeal to the buyer's interest. Because by asking questions, we're honing in the conversation to the things that are really the most concerned to them. The things which they care about the most, they have the most interest in knowing about, is what we're going to talk about. So I'm not talking about pink, I'm talking about blue. They want to know about blue. They like that. And then we come up with some power questions that really help us understand the client's needs to find out if we are the solution or not. And then also, we try and widen the gap for the buyer between where they are now and where they want to be. We'll talk about that in a minute because there's no urgency, as we said before, there's no sale. Our job is to create that sense of urgency. So we're now over here, we've done our pre-planning, we've looked at the uh, company's website, uh, we've looked at their annual report, we've Googled the company to find out any current information on them, we've checked out the people on LinkedIn, or whatever, Facebook, or whatever it might be. Now we've done the rapport building, we've broken through all the clutter that's in their mind before we get into the meat of the meeting, which is we start to look at what they're interested in doing right here in the intersection. So, our job, ask questions, find out if the solutions we've got match needs. If they don't, don't waste any more of their time or your time. So I can see that today is not a good match. We are not going to be able to provide you with the things that you need. I have heard there is XYZ company that has that. They might be a good prospect to talk to. It's not going to work today for what we have. We'll not match you need. And leave it right there. They will appreciate the honesty. They'll appreciate the referral to somebody else. And don't waste your time anymore with that client. Go and find a client who has got things that you can actually supply. And that will happen. You won't always have the exact solution for everybody. And don't try and mask what is actually a non-solution as a solution. Because it will end in tears for everybody, especially you. Because you'll waste a lot of time trying to you know, put the uh, square peg in the round hole here with no great achievement. So get out of there. So in your manuals on page page 2.2, see a rather complicated looking diagram there, but there are a number of elements to this. There's a questioning model set there, as is, should be, barrier and uh, payout, and then there are different types of buyers, financial, executive, technical, user buyers, and then we're trying to dig into their primary interest their buying motive, other considerations of buying criteria to understand it. These are the sorts of frameworks we need to get to the bottom of what the client actually needs. Now sometimes the client themselves are not really clear on what they need. Business can be complicated. There are many things happening. We don't always have data to support what we're doing. Uh, sometimes we don't have a good view of where we are in the market relative to competitors. Sometimes we're not keeping up with the trends in the market because those trends are emerging. It's a complicated business being in business. These question sets, though, do help us to try and produce clarity for them and for us. And often that is the case. We do provide a lot of clarity. areas. The primary interest is the 
basic thing they're looking for. If they're looking for more buyers, more revenue, that's the basic thing. If they're looking for brand awareness, that's the basic thing. If they're looking for reputation to build, they've had a problem, they want to restore the reputation, that's the primary thing. That will be fairly easy to understand. Okay, what are they trying to achieve? What's the main thing? Buying criteria, what would be things would be a buying criteria? What do you think that would be? Money, yeah, what else? Within a certain time. Time. Take a rest, Joy. What else? Decision. Buying criteria, yes, getting permission in the hierarchy, yes. What else is the buying criteria? Size and Color, weight, dimension, delivery. They're all buying criteria. We need that video to be broadcast in April, on April 1. That's a very strict timeline to buying criteria. Right, so those are the sort of mechanics of budget, timing, in color, those sorts of things. Size, dimension, that type of weight, whatever. What would be some other considerations? Sorry? Value added things. Yeah, well, be some additional things, you know, beyond the basics, right? It might be a guarantee, right? It might be free delivery. Okay? It might be ability to combine with an existing product they already have. Okay? It might these are the types of what to haves, right? What to have these. Buying criteria usually must have these. If it's outside of our budget, we can't do it because we don't have the money. If it's in blue, it's not going to work because we need it in pink. Okay. These are nice to have. I thought it'd be good if we had that. We'd like that. Free delivery or whatever it might be. A follow-up session or whatever. The buying motive. This is what's in it for me personally, the buyer, sitting across the desk from you. Okay, there's my company's interest, and then there's my personal interest. If this works, I might get promoted. If this works, I might not get fired. If this works, I might get a big bonus. If this works, I might have more status in the organization. If this works, I might be a winner and go on that luxury trip to the Bahamas as the annual prize. There will be a whole bunch of things for that particular person you're talking to, which are related to the company, but are really focused around them and what's in it for me. Now, if you could find that out, that gives you a lot of scope to mold your solution in those terms. Okay, your solution will have to deliver on their primary interest. It'll have to meet their buying criteria. It may have some extras that make it attractive relative to somebody else's alternative. But if you can hit this one, that's a bullseye. Because then, now, you're framing in terms of their personal benefit. Their personal benefit is wrapped up in the benefit to the company. They're not separate. But it's a subset within the company's overall gain, which is very key to them. And that's why we're going to try and ask some questions to find that out. This is the why, okay? This is the what, okay? This is the why. Understanding their why, gold, pure gold right there. Any questions on this? So we're trying to find out through our question, okay? Now, I said before, salespeople are poor listeners. They tend not to ignore the client, but they are pretty good at pretending to listen. They're brilliant at selective listening. Not so great at attentive and proactive listening. 
ignore, obviously, you're not paying any attention. So they're having a conversation and you're talking about something that doesn't even match up. Unlikely to happen. But pretend listening, as I said before, you've got what you want to say. So you make like you're listening, but in fact you're not really listening. And you're definitely not listening for the things they're not saying. You're not at that depth yet. And the selective listening is, oh, I only want to hear the bits that are interesting to me. All this other stuff you're talking about, don't care about that. I only want to hear about timing or volume or you know, size or budget or whatever it might be. So you tune out everything else. We've got to stop ourselves from doing that and be very attentive and preferably proactive in our listening. Proactive, attentive listening would be our ability to paraphrase what they just said. So it shows we were paying attention. Proactive listening would be to hear what they said but also anticipate something they might say by asking a question. Or, in that case, would that have some implications for your American market? So you've actually taken it to a, another stage, really listening carefully. We lose a lot of valuable hints and information here. Now, clients don't always tell us everything. They tend to hide information. So if we're not listening carefully, we can miss the basic stuff. We'll never even get to the deep stuff. So be patient. Don't chop the client off okay, before they finish their sentence. That's a classic. Jump in and finish the sentence for them. That's another one. Either chop them off and reorient the sentence, or finish the sentence for them. Another bad mistake. Don't do that. Let them finish. Let them say the whole thing. Wait. Don't get into selective listening. If you think that's a relevant point, just write it down and leave it, and then go back to concentrating completely on what they're saying. Don't get distracted into thinking, oh, they made that point about delivery. Oh, good, I can talk about our speedy delivery capacity and how I help this company to really make a tight deadline, and that'll be impressive for them. Suddenly, you're off on this tangent about one thing they mentioned, which may or may not be a critical thing, and you're not really listening to it. So we've got to be disciplined about that. So when we get the questioning model, it's as is, should be barriers pay out. So as is, is their current situation. And these two should be where they want to be. These can be flipped in the question. You might start with where are you now? Or you might start with where do you want to be? You know? So you've got this questioning model. What is your current situation? Where is the business today? Should be is, well, you know, in a perfect world, where would you like to see your business? What would success look like for you? Now barriers are, well you've told me where you want to be and you've told me where you are today. I'm just wondering what's preventing you from being where you want to be now? What's holding this back? Because you're looking for problems here, right? You're looking for, you're the solution to their problem. That's where it is, right? We're here, we're not here. There's a gap. We want to know why that gap isn't already filled. Why aren't they doing it themselves? They know what they need to do, but they haven't done it. Why? That could be us. We could be the solution part there. And then the payout is asking them what's in it for them personally. And we're going to ask that in a very subtle way. And uh, my experience with Japanese buyers is they never tell you what's in it for them personally, ever. They always talk about how it will help the team, how it will help the division, how it will help the company. They always talk in group terms. I've never heard any Japanese talk about themselves personally. I ask, but they never tell me. But that's okay. If that's important to them, then we talk in those terms later when we're presenting the solution. Now, the other thing that's in here are the implications. The implications here are implications of not taking any action. They know where they are. They know where they want to be. If the gap between those two things is thought to be small, nothing happens. I think I've got a slide here on that. Uh, let's see, this one here. You know, this 
gap between where they are and where they need to be, we have to accentuate the distance. This is a big gap. There's an opportunity cost to not fixing that problem. Because if we don't, they have no impetus, they have no urgency to take any action whatsoever. It's like me, as I gave that example before. I had a business meeting. They've got something I think is quite good. It's within my budget. I actually would like to do it, but I'm just too busy. There's been no gap built with me yet to the opportunity cost of me not doing that. That part in the sales process with this particular salesperson has not even been started, so I take no action. Okay. I'm a buyer, but I haven't bought a thing. You're going to have the same problem. You're going to have buyers who, yes, should buy, they can buy, they want to buy, but they don't buy. Because the gap between where they are now and where they should be isn't felt to be very far. We have to help them understand that there is a cost of non-action. There is an opportunity cost of not taking action today. Their rivals, their competitors are not standing still. The market is not static. Right? They have targets. They are going to have further targets. They need to invest today. They need to get from here to here as fast as possible because the world is moving so much faster. That is where your solution comes in to help them. So these questions are said, they're going to feed to get this information from the client. Where as is, okay, what are you trying to achieve? As is should be, there's a gap there. As is, what's your buying criteria? Should be, maybe some things you're not getting today you'd like. Okay. What, are the, what are the barriers in here? What's in it for you? Now, we have different types of buyers too. What would be the difference between a financial buyer and an executive buyer, do you think? What would their outlook be different? How would it be different? What do you think? Typical CFO, CEO. What would be the difference in Apple? What's the CEO worried about? Keeping his job. Keeping his job. Well, the CFO might be worried about that too. But what would be the difference? Contrast CEO and CFO. What, what is their viewpoint that's different? The CEO has a more broad viewpoint the bottom line. And they have answers to shareholders. The CEO is interested in the strategy. They're interested in the direction. Often it's very big picture. It's forward thinking. They've got accountability. Right? So they're at, they're at one level. What about the CFO? What's the CFO worried about? Return on investments. Sorry? Return on investments. Uh, Return on, on investment means what? Um, how long before this gets into some break even point? Or they're worried about, yes, the financials. Break even, profit, cost, cost center investment amount, uh, p &L basically, right? The p &L. They're worried about how they're going to make cash flow to pay all the bills, right? They got a very finite look at that around numbers usually. What about the technical user? What are they worried about? What do you think? What's a technical buyer worried about? Product that they're buying. What about that product? Specification. Spec. Right? Is it is what we're going to receive the right spec for the job? Yeah. What else are they worried about? Uh, Timelines. Timing, yes, or receiving it on, they get it on time. What else are they worried about? Yes. Spec. What is the technical buyer worried about? Maybe they worry if it's a good fit. Is it going to work? Are there any guarantees if it doesn't work? They're worried about all those sorts of things. What about the user buyer? What are they worried about? What do you think? User buyer. Yeah. Sorry? Can't hear you. 
okay, is going to do what it's supposed to do. All right, that's what, what else are they worried about? So I don't understand what the user needs. Okay, you're actually going to have the product and use it yourself. You're going. You might be in a company and say, uh, say there's a particular uh, machine. You're going to be the one using the machine. The company's going to buy the machine, but you'll be the one actually using the machine or the service. You're the one actually using the service. Right? If you're in the PR department and they're getting an outside, outsourced PR company to come in and help, you're going to be the one working off what they provide. Is that going to work for you? That's what you're doing. So, so it's what? Make my life easier. Yes, it's going to make my life easier. Will this make? Will it be easy to use? Will we have to spend a lot of time integrating this? Is it going to be something we can pick up straight away and, and run with? You've got your self-interest there. So when we talk to these different buyers, they have different interests. They have totally different interests. There's one more layer that's not not in there. This is a very important layer too. It's about the personality style of the buyer. Now, anyone heard of Myers-Briggs? Myers-Briggs, right? There are 16 boxes in the Myers-Briggs construct right, about your personality type. I don't know about you, but I can't hold 16 data points in my head. That's too many for me. Can't remember all that stuff. I can remember two things. So when we try and understand the personality type of the buyer, there are two things I can understand. On this horizontal line, I can understand in terms of assertion, are they low or are they high? That means very strong opinion, very confident, lots of energy when they speak, assertive. Or the opposite, low energy, hesitating, not very sure, never voiced an opinion. That's your scale. Where would we put Joy on that scale, do you think? Is she low in assertion or high in assertion? So she's reasonably she's high. off the scale, basically. <laughs> she's over here. Very low. She's off the scale, right? So, so we, we meet her, we know straight away, oh, she's a very assertive person, right? She's up here. The other scale is people versus task. People who are interested in task outcomes, bottom line, results, numbers, what happens to the investment, right? They're very much focused on the task. They don't care about the people as much as they care about the outcome. We're going to take that hill, 501. You're all going to die, but we'll complete the task. That's the thinking. Don't care about the people, get the task done. The opposite, really worry about the people. Can we get the team to come together and work as a unit? How can we combine the power of the group? How will people feel about this? That's what concerns this group of people up here. Okay? So you've got these contracts. So we can put them into four buckets, basically. This is rough, but it's pretty accurate. If they're people-oriented and assertive, okay, then they are someone who's um, often salespeople. Uh, they are uh, actors. Trainers, right? They're very much big picture people, right? They're interested in. Don't give me the detail, give me the big picture. Right? That's one group. When they're assertive and they are task oriented, call that the driver. Often the CEO, the boss, the owner of the company, 
Time is money. Right? Time is money type of people. When they're task oriented but not very assertive, often analytical engineers, researchers, scientists, lawyers, accountants, okay, this type of thing. This one up here, they're people oriented but they're not particularly assertive. Call them amiables, rather uh, get to know you first. Uh, in most countries, if you go into the countryside, the people in the countryside don't like anyone standing too close to them. They don't like people who talk loudly. Everything's a bit calmer. Uh, a bit like this. They don't like fast talking people. They don't like loud so often they'll be in, uh, say, librarians. I can think of librarians as one. Quiet, you know, atmosphere. You'll see a lot of them in offices. They're doing uh, operational tasks that they do themselves in a group. They have a group for feeling, but they're not. Um, it doesn't require them to be uh, very outgoing. What do you think we could call this one? Outgoing, assertive, people oriented. It's a good word for this group. Influencers? Influencers, yeah. Influencers. These guys could be influencers. It's my way or the highway. Networkers, yeah, what else? Troy's peeking over here. Communicators. Communicators, yeah, what else? Yeah, politicians. As a, yeah, that's <laughs> an occupation, thank you. Influences. Influences, yeah, we had that one, what else? It won't be in there. Because <laughs> it's... So it's a lot of that. What do we call it? Features. That's an occupation. Okay. I'm stuck on a car, so I have the driver, the GPS person, the person who makes sure to drive friendly over there, and so the people, people person, and mm -hmm. so the, the people person. organizer. The, the people person. They're, they're extroverts. Radio. They're extroverts. I'm sorry. The, the car radio going on. Yeah, the radio. <laughs> Crank up the music. Yeah, the trip organizer. We'll call them influences. Okay. They are seeking to convert us to an idea. Okay. And they've got high people orientation. They work both. The trick is when we meet people to try and adjust ourselves accordingly. So we get to this person, they're very time is money. Don't think you're going to have a cup of tea with this person. Don't be short, sharp, and business-like with this person. Take your time. They want micro detail. You better have the detail. Come with numbers. Come with proof. Come with evidence. For these guys, big picture. Big picture is good. Don't, they hate detail. Salespeople, every single salesperson hates the CRM. The customer relationship managers in the company, they hate it because it's got a detail. You've got to type all this stuff in. I don't do that. I want to spend my time with, with, with buyers. I'm wasting my time. Typical non detail oriented person. Okay. These guys are very detail oriented. So as you meet people, you won't know which one they are. If they're very boom, 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 time is money type, 
get straight down to them. They don't care about small talk. They don't care about having a cup of tea with you. I think there are three reasons we should do this. They are A, B, C. What do you think? Oh, that's good. Let's do it. Get out of my office. Done. That's it. No more discussion. Very sharp, quick decision makers. Make a decision, move on. Lots of detail. Lot, you know, like three decimal places at least. Okay, on the numbers. Take your time. Build a relationship. It's going to take time. Big picture. How great this is going to be. That's going to rock. Not detail oriented. Make that little matrix in your head when you meet people and say high assertion, low assertion, high people, high task, where are they? And you'll hear it. They're talking about the outcomes, it'll be here. They're talking about the people, it's going to be up here. That's why you need to shut up and let them talk. That's why you find out, oh, okay. Once you know that, then you, know, you might need to speed up and strengthen your speech. You might need to slow down and soften your speech. Same here, you might need to slow it down a bit and become very detailed. You might need to become very effervescent. More animated. Because that's what they're like. Look at him. Okay. Well, I think for today, we've gotten as far in as we're going to get. It's a good start.